Hey guys, welcome back. This has been a long time in the making. This is September when I first initially visited Blatt's Billiards in New Jersey. They've been making pool tables for over 100 years. This is their 100th anniversary. My business partner Howard bought a pool table from them and then that's what got me connected to them. We got into a conversation about Type on Glue. We contacted Type on Glue and the three of us are doing a collaboration to celebrate glue and to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Blatt's Billiards. They have an incredible factory down in New Jersey. They have a hundred years worth of supplies, many, many antiques, endless skilled tradesmen working for them. They build tables from scratch. They restore a lot of tables. The incredible design that you see walking around this place so many beautiful antique tables getting restored back to perfect condition. Some original new designs being made side by side. What an inspiring place. So much wood carving under one roof. Absolutely beautiful, skilled trades being displayed there. Now here we are in my shop in upstate New York. And I'm getting my slates delivered so that I could build the table of my dreams. Now, each table is made up of three slates. Each one of these slates weighs about 200 pounds. That's why they make them in three parts, so that your typical pair of tradesmen can carry them into a house and take them apart. Each slate has this wooden back and poplar, and it's glued directly to it with tight bond. And that's what they're explaining to me there is that the wood is sliced up so that when it shrinks and expands, it doesn't pop off. I think it's to use original type on, and that's poplar on the back of the slate. The slates come from South America, and at Blatt, they customize the back of them and install the wood on them, just like you see there. Now, the table is made up of three parts. You have the head and the foot. There's so many traditional rules and regulations, and the head and the foot might mean something to somebody that plays pool professionally, but to me it's just a way to orientate which holes go where. To educate myself on this build, I made a practice table. This is just crummy pine from Home Depot. I made up the pockets and the rails just to get some practice before I went and spent some money on some high-end wood. I ended up going and getting some walnut and some maple and some poplar. Here I am at first cut. This is where I buy most of my exotic woods. This is in upstate New York, Cold Spring, New York. And this is where my buddy Rob works. And so Rob always gets me the good stuff. So if you're in the Hudson Valley region, check out First Cut. And I got about a thousand dollars worth of wood to start. I knew I was probably going to need more, but this was just to get a good start. And here I'm back at the shop and I got 12 foot pieces and now I need a clean edge on it and I'm gonna do that by using my new Festool saw with the long track there I, I actually bought that for a thousand dollars and it makes the craziest whiny sound that sounds like it's breaking but everybody tells me it's not but it gives me a nice clean long straight cut then I can take it over to the table saw and rip the pieces that I need. I'm being fairly economical with the wood. The poplar isn't as expensive as the walnut. So here you see I start splitting some of it. I split the wood and I glue it to the poplar. And I end up having about a quarter inch skin in some spots and a full thickness of walnut in other spots. And of course I'm using type on glue to laminate everything together. and letting everything dry overnight. So it seems like I'm breezing right through here, but you'll notice my clothes change and the outdoor light changes. Now obviously here it is the next day and I'm using my hand plane just to knock down a lot of the glue. One of the most important things about making a pool table, in my estimation, is to make sure that it's absolutely sturdy and absolutely strong. You don't want any movement whatsoever. That is why I'm using my dominoes. And that's why I'm making this fairly thick, if you notice, ultimately, 
how it all goes together and how thick it becomes. And of course I'm using tight bond glue to make sure nothing ever comes apart. Lots of clamps. I used more clamps on this than I did on the boat. And I'm working on the short rails and the long rails and I'm making both sets longer than I need so that I have plenty of room to creep up on my mitered corners. I'm fairly nervous to get prepared to cut my mitered corners. I'm not even sure that I'll be able to cut them cleanly on the chop saw at this point because of the girth and height of these rails. But ultimately everything worked out fine. Here you see me adding more, in fact this is poplar, adding the poplar spacers underneath there just to build up that thickness. And cleaning away my glue and adding more and more material. Now if I was to dedicate all that space to walnut, it probably would have been crazy. I didn't think to split the top parts until I made the side parts. I probably would have done that had I thought I would have been able to save almost a full plank of walnut. And I'm able to cut through there. I'm shovel checking with my Starrett compound angle finder there, my compound square, combination square, more accurately. And I was getting really good, accurate cuts with this Milwaukee chop saw. And these rails were so long and so heavy, I had to hang them in space. And I used a stilt at the end of each cut, and I clamped it to the chop saw so nothing moved while I was rolling through it. You see there, that's where I'm putting a stilt on it, just to keep it all level. Doing my test fits. I noticed that Blatt, they did not build the rails around the slate, but again, this is my very first time doing this, so I was really insecure that I wasn't going to make anything perfectly accurate. So I built around my slates as if I was building right in space. And now it's time to start carving the pockets. I temporarily screwed them together through the corner. I knew my design ultimately was going to have a steel band around it, so the broad center of both sides or all four sides of the rails I knew were going to get covered so that's why I didn't hesitate to throw a screw through the corner because ultimately I end up throwing a long lag bolt completely through that 45 degree corner I thought that the table was going to need to come completely apart and I would have to take the frame completely apart because originally this table was going to be on display at a woodworking show so I originally made it so that we could dismantle it, maybe sit, put, put it together inside of a packing crate, take it apart, put it in a packing crate. Ultimately, that's not what we ended up doing. It's just going to stay and live in my shop. In hindsight, I would have glued the corners because now they're opening up a little bit with shrinkage and whatnot. So there's, a, there's not the tightest miters on the corner. Now I'm carving out the space on the bottom of each one of the pockets. If you notice, the pocket has a bronze casting, and the bronze casting accepts a bolt from up and underneath. And there's a little bit of structure underneath the bronze casting part, and you need to chisel that out. I'm also preparing for the router cut. I start hand chiseling it, and right there is going to be a bit of the finish work. So that's why I wanted to chisel it so I can define my line because it's going to be living directly along the edge of the leather pocket. You saw me use a pull saw to cut out a lot of that material. Ultimately, I went in there with a saber tooth disc, and I polished out the inside of each one of those pockets. But I did that off camera the day we installed the pockets. So, so there are six pockets, and I did each one of them already once. Ultimately, I ended up doing 12 pockets. I got better as time went on. Here you see me installing the bolt that went all the way through each corner. I had a whole plan in play to dismantle the rails if I needed to. Ultimately it gets covered with a piece of steel which is more decorative. 
so I wasn't all concerned about the hole I was creating right there. And I wanted that pull directly through that 45 degree corner to be nice and tight. Ultimately, I did not have to take it apart. And it's nice to finally see it come together as I begin to palm sand it and clean it up and get it ready for the next step. There are many parts of the pool table that are made by other suppliers. And this is one of those that you get these rubber, hard rubber bumpers. And this extrusion or this profile of wood you see there. These get glued together. And here you see me using tight bond. Just that vulcanized rubber gets glued directly to that wood. And that's how it works. These were all a little bit longer than the distance between every one of the two pockets. So I had a very, very specific amount of material not to mess up. And Jeff gave me templates to utilize. So I knew what angle to make what. And if I just took my time and made sure that I set up each one of the cuts, double check my marks, double check my area where things get glued. You'll notice that the width of every pocket is very specific. You have your corner pockets and your side pockets. And the distance between the nose of each one of those rubbers has to be very specific. And in some cases, you'll see me handling a spacer. I had a spacer available always around me to make sure that the corner pockets were the certain width and the side pockets were a certain width. And you could see there how close when I cut it, what I have left over is virtually useless. So it's really important that I make every one of my cuts extremely accurate. By taking time, double checking my measurements, making sure that the distance between each one of the pockets gives me the right distance on each rail part. You see me there holding a spacer. Getting rid of the glue so that when I go to put that up against it, everything's nice. And I didn't want the rails to be higher than the sides. Ultimately, I realized the rails should have been lowered a little bit to make room for the felt. But Jeff said what I did isn't completely uncommon. But technically speaking, you want the rails to be a little bit lower so that when you wrap the felt, the felt is at the same height as the side, not just the thickness of the felt itself above it. <laughs> With the side rails and the bumpers in place, now I need to cap the ends with a piece of hard rubber. That's so that when you go to shoot into the pocket, the balls will bounce off of this hard rubber and shoot down into the pocket. It protects that wood there, gives that a nice soft cushion on any angled shot that comes in. Now those are supposed to be 90 degrees north-south or you could also say in the z-axis. I made them perfectly 90. I had to change and fix them later, but it wasn't bad because the top cut where I'm working right there, all I had to do is be 12 degrees down and in. So all I had to do is remove material. I peeled off those black corners, did that work and glued them back on ultimately. But you see what I'm doing there is I'm working that hard rubber with 80 grit sandpaper to work it cleanly into the bumpers so it's seamless. Ultimately it gets covered with the felt and you don't see any of it. Now I'm on to making the legs. I had to figure out how to economize the material that I had. And here I came up with this design that utilized the six side, six sides of a tapered leg. And here I'm maximizing the amount of material by using this 7 8 inch material, which I guess you might say it's 1 inch. But here I'm using each piece twice. I'm splitting them down to about 3 8 of an inch. And ultimately you'll see this jig that I made where I'm able to bevel each one of the sides on the table saw in the jig. And you'll notice I cut one side, flip it to the other side of the jig and cut the other side. I'm putting that angle on there. Either it's a 30 or a 60, I think it's a 30, or maybe it's 15 degrees, I can't remember. 
and ultimately when I tape all that together and fill in that gap with type on you see me using type on 3 a lot just because I'm just used to it because I used it so many times when I was working on the boat I can kind of predict its work time and what it feels like on my hands and how to clean it off and what I could expect it to do to the wood so I'm just so used to it so here you see that I'm just using electrical tape to keep this clamped and I double check and make sure that it's not being clamped in an odd oblong make sure that all the joints are closed as they should be and you'll notice I have that grid cutting mat there is an occasion that I am looking to make sure that the sides are parallel utilizing the lines on the mat you want each opposite side to be parallel and if they're not you gotta make sure that you don't have a smaller piece in there it goes together fairly well so that I'm pretty confident that everything is in order everything's pretty much correct I took a big 20 inch sanding disc glued it to plywood and that's how I'm getting my nice flat perfect match face and here with the pencil I'm marking the parallel from the opposite side I'm marking it on each one of them then I go and hand sand right up to the line and then I bring it back over to that same big plat platen and I hand sand and get everything right up to the line I'm my goal is to split the line in half I don't want it to go away then this way I know if it goes away then I'm lost in space but I split it in half. And now these are the parts that are going to make up the cap of the big tapered leg. And I'm using a darker type on. It glues dark. It fills gaps. It works really well. And I glue each one of the caps onto the legs. Let it dry overnight. And then I take it to my bandsaw to help start the bevel. It's going to be a backwards bevel. I like to cut a lot of things when they're in place and together and then I take it over to the sanding disc and I just kiss it on the sanding disc at the right angle that I want and everything gets nice and chooched up. Now this is the other end of the leg. These are blanks I prepared off camera and I'm turning them on the lathe and it's a way to go from the faceted side to the round side. This is going to be the finial between the bottom of the frame and the top of the leg. There's a lot of engineering that goes into this. Here I'm trapping a one inch bolt that's going to go up through the bottom of the frame and I'm using the type bond CA glue to glue those bolts in place and then they get trapped. Once they're glued there, they get trapped between the top of the hexagon and the round puck that I just made on the lathe. So there you see how that bolt ultimately gets trapped. And those big bolts are what's going to bolt into the bottom of the frame, you'll see in a minute. Now these are gonna be the parts that make up the small feet at the other end of the taper and I'm gluing on that peg with the type on CA glue to go into the lathe chuck. And then also it creates a center point that will glue underneath and inside of the tapered, small tapered end. And the way I do it is I make the first one and I use that first one as my pattern to make the others. It's the same thing that I did with the top round part. I make one that I like and then visually I just try and match it to the others. And here even though it's the dark blue it's still important to wash it off because you will have a little bit of a difference in the finish. So I use a wet rag and an ice cream stick there or a tongue depressor. Now we're on to the next big part which is a little nerve-wracking for me. This is going to be the framework that goes between the slates and the legs I just made. And this is all hard maple I got from Home Depot. I knew that it would all ultimately be buried and hidden. And it was going to have some reinforced glue joints. That's why I didn't need to use the domino. There was a lot of overlapping when I glued all this together. I established the angle. And I made sure I carried it throughout. 
and again this is a little bit of a, a rough assembly only because it all gets hidden and it all gets a treatment over it, it gets a whole skin of walnut this is where your circular saw skills come into play all this wood needed to be pre-drilled because you snap screws into it instantly everything had to be pre-drilled and glued and it's the type of wood that would ruin your countersink because it's so hard your countersink goes on fire to pull it into square I put that rope on it and I twisted that rope to double check and see where a square you check your diagonals if you're trying to make a perfect square your diagonals need to be exactly the same and then you know you're square and I'm starting to build up those layers. I needed to take each one of those pieces and take them on the table saw and flatten the top or bring them into that angle. I think it was a 15 degree angle everywhere. All the side pieces had to be cut with a small 15 degree angle off of the top of each long side. Now I ultimately make the last layer in poplar and I build it on the weld table so that it's perfectly flat. Here everything is domino joined together and each slate lays exactly on those seams because each slate has screw holes that need to land on some wood. Here I'm kicking off all the glue getting everything as flat as possible but then I bring the frame, the frame box, I don't know what a good word to call it, it would be the frame box, I bring the frame box over to the welding table and I make sure everything fits, I locate it, I raise it up, and then I screw a bunch of tight bond under there and let it fall into place and let it dry. Now it's time to do the exterior finish, which I'm using all the scrap walnut that I had laying around from the initial build on the top rails. I cut everything into these small little strips. Each strip had to be sanded a little bit because they were all furry, so this is a very lengthy process but it was fun and ultimately I really like the way it looks you can see how that all that glue joint on all those sticks definitely gives some strength to those two pieces that do not have domino joints in them I let everything run long so that I get a nice clean match by cutting everything in place. I tried a couple of different tools for that task but that noisy one worked the best. I don't show the full task but I covered all of that maple in walnut. You can see it's done there. Now it's time to paint it. This is the first coat to bring up the grain and to start the building process of the paint finish. When I work on something like this, there's usually a time where I begin to build the finish. Even though it's not done, I can always sand it later, which is what I ultimately do. Here, this is the first bit of metal that has to go in place, because this has to go on, so it's there when I put the legs in place. And the combination of the metal and the rough sawn wood is a little bit of an homage to the rustic type of work that I often do. Here you see me grinding those welds into shape and I'm banging it down. I welded in some screw tabs and you'll see me here putting the screws into the screw tabs getting everything nice and flat. I had to build up a small little pad in each corner so that the legs sat directly on wood the steel stuck up just a little bit. I'm drilling those holes to accept the one inch thick bolts in each corner. I had just enough of space in the corners to put the bolt on when I got the bolts and the nut in there. This is the blackener that I've used for several years and you see how I sanded the paint finish one time and I'm adding a second coat on there and the steel got the blackener and also got a spray finish of polyurethane. 
Here I'm giving the spar varnish, the total boat spar varnish coat on everything. Just like I said, I like to start building the coats when I get close to the end as opposed to waiting to the very end. As we get close, you could also start to see where you might have finger spots and glue that got away from you. So you could sand it before you're ready to be done, done, done. Me and Mike flip over the table. We start installing the legs. I had just enough room in that corner to get the bolt on. Not enough room, though, to put a washer over it. I had to modify that wrench so that I can get around the bolt. It did not have a socket big enough. I don't show it, but I also put in another screw, a T25 deck screw, to keep the legs from turning. This is a very exciting moment getting to see the table painted. I checked the level on it and it's fairly level just sitting there. Even though we're not ready to put the felt on, I do need to put the rails in place and start fitting up the steel accents. And that's what we're doing now. We're putting the table in place, getting it assembled so that I could... This is an exciting moment. It's the first time I'm seeing everything together in the shop. Now I'm doing the steel accents. I made this little die that would give me an offset flange there. And that is one by two, one quarter by two inch thick cold rolled steel. And you see by putting it under the hydraulic press, I'm able to get that little jog. It's a subtle thing, but my inspiration here was a whiskey barrel band. And you always seem to see the whiskey barrel bands kind of hugging and taking up the bump. And now I made my measured pieces. This is going to be the corner. You can see I've already done a couple that are sitting on the weld table. And these are all the pieces between the corners and the side pockets. If I'm going to blacken them, I need to get off all the material. I need to get off all the dirt and grease. Otherwise, the blackening agent does not work. It's pretty incredible. You spend so much time cleaning it, then you see where you haven't cleaned it by putting on the blackening agent. The blackening agent turns black and then it kind of gets a little powdery. I hit it with triple zero scotch bright and clean it off and then give it a coat of poly. Here you see me using the construction adhesive from Type Bond. I glued the steel directly to the wood. And then I come back the next day and I put all the rivets in. And that glue works really good, obviously. You can see how I broke it down into several pieces. The two side pockets get the straights and they've obviously each corner gets an angle. Now it's the next day, but the glue is still a little slippery, but strong enough to keep it in place. So you see one of these pieces move a little bit. That's because I kind of broke it free. And this concept of the rivets was an idea I had from the start. Each hole gets drilled and the rivets just fit through there. There's a tight tolerance. That's why I'm hammering them in like nails. I don't need any fasteners or anything. They were hammered in so tightly that everything is now really secured together. Now Jeff finally shows up at the end of 10 months to put the table together in a professional manner. And I'm learning from him. In this circumstance, I am his apprentice. Jeff brought out this crazy Starrett level. It is super accurate. Simply by changing one or two of those pads, the bubble goes way off or way on. And it's, he said it's his prize piece that he brings to every installation to make sure everything is level. And now what you see him doing here is he uses a quarter and he slides the quarter past the seam. And if you don't hear the click, you're flat and everything is nice and perfect. Uh, the, the middle one, sorry. No more shims needed. Now this is a crazy, crazy tradition. Just regular beeswax and a torch fills in all the screw holes and the seam. Now everything's dead flat. He knows he can cover up all the screw holes. You can get it out later, obviously, because it's only beeswax. It's not a filler that is catalyzed or anything. It's just wax. And so you notice with the torch, you could bring it right back to life and swipe it out. 
and he keeps scraping and pulling up the bits and sticking them back onto that screwdriver handle that's holding the big globule. So he keeps recycling it. This is the scene between the tables. This is what I said earlier on, how the pool table business has so many traditions. And there you see, while it's warm, you scrape it right up and you just roll it back onto the screwdriver. And now Jeff's sanding and making sure there's no imperfections because now we're going to put the felt on. And it's important that nothing gets trapped under the felt. Now this just seems like a tradition where you sweep and sweep and sweep and then you shake it and you get all the dust, any debris, shake it hard. And now you lay it on the table and ta-da, time for dinner. It's nice to see a professional like Jeff go right to business knows exactly what he wants to do. He's hitting spots so quickly with that stapler, but he has confidence because he's practiced over and over and over again. I interview Jeff at the very end. I ask him about the family business, Blatt Billiards. So hang around and check it out. You can see how fast he's installing this felt. It's stretched from side to side and the flatness in the middle is simply because it's secured on extreme sides with just staples. This electric staple gun obviously works very, very, very well. It lands the staples flat, easy and in. It's like wrapping a very complicated present. You want to make sure all your pleats, all your darts, all your folds land in a pleasant manner. You don't want things to seem random. You can see how far Jeff can stretch that material. I'd certainly be afraid to stretch it as, as aggressively as he's doing it, but he has experience. He knows exactly what he can get out of that material, which is nice. Having experience goes a long way. And now with that razor blade, he goes right to town like a samurai. I was amazed at how much the material stretched in through the pockets cleanly. He just had to get rid of a pleat at each edge, but he knew exactly what to do. Now that this table is stretched, I take all my tools. I don't lean anything on it. Now with all that stretching, you still have to cut open your bolt holes for the rail. There's going to be a bunch of bolts that come up through the bottom and go right into the rail. And now it's time to install the felt on the bumpers and the felt gets installed from the top and it wraps down and under and gets stapled on the bottom. But this is a very clever technique. You bang a batten into that little gap that's created when you glue on the wooden part that has the bumpers glued to it. So if you scroll back and you look, you'll see there's a gap at the top of each one of the rails, the bumper, the bumper rails. And that's to accept the material and a stick like you see here, which again is another material or type of thing that gets supplied to a company that makes pool tables. We did have to adjust them with the hand plane, but we got everything in and we turned the table over and Jeff is starting to stretch. I didn't show it, but you could see where those little discs are screwed to the undersides of the rails. When the table was snugly fit on top of the slates, I just reached up and traced a, a hole through the uh, slates with a pencil. And I knew exactly where to drill those holes and install those plates. Now it's time to install the pockets. Just inspecting, making sure everything looks good. Jeff wants to make extra sure he didn't trap a staple or a piece of sawdust between the felt and the rubber. Now each one of the pockets gets bolted in up from the bottom. I had a little trouble. I kept cross-threading mine. Jeff got all of his put in while I did one. And this is the really big ta-da moment. Really it came together nice. It was a choice between the bright green and the dark green. We ultimately went with the darker green. And now I'm lying under the table, tightening those bolts through that bolt hole. 
that goes up into the bottom of the rails is a little screw plates that you see eventually throughout the video. Now Jeff's installing the pockets. The pockets get screwed up inside of the rail under the flap for the pocket holes which then get trimmed to shape for each one of the corners and the side pockets. You see here Jeff is trimming them to shape and just much like a shoemaker he decides where he wants to leave them and how they're going to interact with the corner because it's really important you don't want it to interfere with the shot. So Jeff nails them into place. What goes on top of what, what goes on top of what is important in this game to make sure each one of the pockets has a fighting chance of being accurate. These little dots get installed with a sticky back adhesive in a very specific spot which is a certain amount up and a certain amount over. It's starting to look like a pool table. <laughs> the very last thing to finish are the sights. Those are the dots that go on the rails between each one of the pockets. I took the rivets that I used in the side and I mashed them into a small tapered flat top. I didn't want to try and do mother of lay in inlay there, mother of pearl inlay. I knew I would mess it up. You need 18 of them, and I had 18 shots to make it look bad, so I wanted to try and just use this rivet. It kind of goes along with the theme, and when I installed them, I actually really did like them. And I banged them in deeply so that you don't get snagged. I also did scotch bright them so that there were no hang-ups on there. This is my jig in the middle of the 5-inch rail always 11 and a half inches apart from the center out and then from pocket to pocket from the center the center pocket the center side pocket out 11 and a half inches from the center of the side pocket in each direction and this is the big finish this is a plaque that I made on the CNC machine I did not have brass so I made it in a piece of acrylic and spray painted it gold and there you see, designed by me, under the direction of Blatt, held together by Typon. Thank you, Blatt Billiards, and happy 100th anniversary. And thank you, Typon. And thank you to the fans that have been supporting me now going on 12 years here on YouTube, my self-produced maker channel. Thank you very much, and stick around for the interview with Jeff at the very end. So tell everybody who you are and what you make. Uh, my name's Jeff Roeder from Black Billiards. We manufacture custom pool tables. And how long have you been doing that? I've uh, been doing it from the womb. <laughs> really? So you yeah. were born into Black? Born and raised, uh, you know, summers, winters, throughout high school, college, and uh, everything from the bottom up. And when you went to college, you knew you were going to get out and go right back into the pool table business? Uh, it was in the back of my mind. <laughs> you know, it definitely yeah. helped, uh, you know, taking the lessons that we learned in school and then being able to oh, apply, apply to a them family to a, business. you know, a practical use that yeah. we do every day. Just to clarify, your name is not Blatt. Jeff Roeder. Blatt was a business that you said your grandfather got involved with. Yeah, Blatt Billiards, uh, founded in 1923 in New York City. And then um, after World War II, my grandfather started out from the bottom up and just worked his way up there and eventually had three sons. Those sons joined the business and then, um, you know, 70 years later, here I am. That's amazing. Sir. And you're going to take it and you're going to keep going? Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, right on. And how's business? Business is good. We still manufacture. We make custom pool tables, everything from entry level all the way up to handcrafted custom tables. We make marble tables, travertine tables. Uh, the stone's imported from Italy. They're crafted over there. It's the basics of the table. They come to our factory in New Jersey. We put them together, do all the fine tuning, and then we ship them out all over the world. Wow. Did you guys develop that stone pool table? You're the first people to do it? Yeah, first people. Yes. And then we got approached by someone who was an expert with marble and stone, and then we collaborated together, and now we have these beautiful travertine marble tables. When Howard, my business partner, first called you, and then you guys were talking, and one thing led to another, and somebody said something about Type-On glue. Type-On. And Howard's like, oh, we work with Type-On. You said you work exclusively with Type-On. Holds type it all together. You know, the tables are made from many pieces of, uh, all different species of wood, and we glue them all together, shape the wood, 
and uh, Typon has not failed us. So and, and you use the Typon to glue the wood to the stone, too. Yeah. And the rubber to the wood. That's correct. That's crazy. You know, we use different types of Typon. Sometimes we have outdoor applications, and we'll use Typon 3. So when Howard said, I know somebody that could make a table, what was your first impression? Honestly. I was like, all right, here we go again. You know, <laughs> so another new project. You know, I have no idea what I'm getting myself into. But, Do you have uh, a lot of people proposing wacky shit all the time? All the time. You know, the marble table started out just with an idea and then, you know, collaboration, right. you know, a couple tests, you know, a lot more refinement. And sure enough, you know, now we have a beautiful line of marble tables. Our next line is going to be the Duress the Rustic Table line. Oh, right, right. I was going to say, I don't want to ask you. Well, I'm just going to say yeah. is I hope you don't regret getting involved. <laughs> no, absolutely. I think we have a beautiful <laughs> table. Answer. We have got a great prototype here, and we're going to yeah, do you. a lot of models after it. I mean, I think thank it's you. a really good hit. Yes. The steel combination with the walnut wood is a home run. Thank you. When I was getting into it, like I tell you, I felt so intimidated in the beginning because I was so worried that I had to like live up to all these gorgeous tables you guys have in your factory. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I'm going to emulate that. But then I was like, what do people look to me for? rustic wood and steel it's mm -hmm. really like where i feel comfortable that's my wheelhouse and yeah. that's why you know late in the design process is like i'm just going to abandon all these fancy billiard western style ideas i had and just go for you know you have simple and rustic you have a lot of uh, flexibility but you know what we did here was we achieved our objectives we have a perfectly uh, billiard specification table. This table meets all the specifications for the Billiards Congress of America. Well, I call them about every two weeks. Yep, we have, a, you know, I think I'm on speed dial now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's the proportions, the measurements are right on. This, this table would hold up to a tournament, no problem. Well, thanks for coming out and putting it together and, and doing the fine details. I yeah, it's a pleasure. It. Yeah, thanks, man. It was a well education for me. It was great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, brother.